first few decades of my life, I lived in Boston, Massachusetts. And I guess you would consider where I lived a dangerous place. There was a lot of crime at the time that I lived there during the 90s. Uh, there were a lot of gangs and robberies, murders, things like that. Nothing so unusual that I would have considered it dangerous. In fact, I always felt safe. But compared to where I live now, it's a whole different world. Living uh, kind of out in the country in a gated community gives you the sense of security. You feel as though you're somehow protected. Is that a false sense of security? It very well could be. Uh, this story that I'm going to talk to you guys about today will make you question where you live. Do you feel safe where you are today? Um, is the danger that you encounter only in other places and not where you live currently? Do you know your neighbors? I will fully admit that I do not know my neighbors, but I do wave to them <laughs> as I pass them by. But this story is going to remind you, danger lurks everywhere where we least expect it. We're going to talk first about a street within a town, Cozy Cove Lane in Tweed, which is a small municipality located in central eastern Ontario. There are approximately 6,000 people there as of the time of this case. 21 cottages lined this road and it overlooked a heart-shaped inlet of Stucco Lake. Beautiful. I've looked at it in photos and what a charming place. I can see why people felt safe there. They did a survey of the residents uh, around 2009 and they asked, what do you value most about Tweed? And some of the answers were safety, neighbors looking out for neighbors. We don't have much crime. We're close knit and friendly. We can police ourselves. So those are pretty positive things. Very bold statements to make. You can police yourself because there's very little crime here. One resident named Ernestine Cole was quoted as saying, and she had lived there for decades, quote, I cannot remember anything bad ever happening here, end quote. That is a bold statement. You can't remember anything bad ever happening there in the decades that you lived there. It's very, very interesting. We're also going to talk about some of the other residents who lived on Cozy Cove because some of these crimes took place there. Larry and his wife, Bonnie Jones, had been calling Cozy Cove home for 40 years. They were high school sweethearts, and they loved living there. Larry and Bonnie had a very large lot of land where they allowed two of their children to build homes. And one of them had 11-year-old twin daughters. And every day, they would get dropped off in front of Larry's house, and they would run in to see their grandparents. And it was very nice life, very close knit family. Larry was retired. So he had a lot of free time on his hands. And he was kind of dubbed the mayor of Cozy Cove. He knew everybody on Cozy Cove, everybody in Tweed. He had relatives on the police force and he was just an all around busy, great guy. He was the fixer. So you'd see him outside shoveling snow. You would see him fixing the asphalt or potholes in the street. He would be the one called if somebody needed a lawnmower fixed or a dishwasher. So Larry was that guy, the guy that you call on and you know that he's going to be there. So next in line are Ron and Monique Murdoch. They had two children, Stephen, 17, and Samantha, who was 12. They were a very kind family, again, close-knit. They knew their neighbors. 
They were always friendly. They were always inviting people over, whether it was for dinner and or dinner and game night. Uh, they did things like barbecuing in the backyard, listening to music, all of that kind of stuff. Uh, next door to them was the lieutenant colonel of the military base, which wasn't far off. And Samantha had to do a paper on somebody she greatly admired. And she chose her neighbor um, because she did. She was, she was very close to him. So she said how much she respected him in her paper. And it gives you a sense of how people felt uh, in, on this road, on this Cozy Cove Lane. So next to the Murdochs were Mary Elizabeth and her husband, Russell Williams, the Lieutenant Colonel. Mary Elizabeth was an executive who worked in Ottawa for the Heart and Stroke Foundation. So the couple had a home there. And because of Russell's job at the military base, they bought a home on Cozy Cove. So he would stay there a lot during the week because he was traveling back and forth. He was extremely, extremely busy. Um, it was a very large military base. So he would stay there and then either travel back to see his wife or she would come up for the weekends. And, you know, they were the couple who garden together, you know, they'd stroll along holding hands, very romantic, very sweet people. Next to the Williams lived a man named Jason Gulliver. I don't know a lot about him. I couldn't find a lot about him when I was doing the research, but he was part of the neighborhood association. That's about all I knew about him. There was a young lady named Jane, not her real name, who moved to Cozy Cove to be closer to her boyfriend's family because he often worked on the road. She had an eight week old baby and Jane was a city girl. She was somebody who was used to the city, to the loudness, to the busyness. So moving to Cozy Cove was a whole new world for her. But because the boyfriend traveled, he felt safer to have her there where his mother was not far away and his friends weren't far away. So she started adjusting to the quiet of the country life or this little area. Uh, and she was very happy on Cozy Cove for a while. So also who else lived there was Lori Mascot. I'm sure I'm saying that wrong, but she moved to Cozy Cove in 1999 with her new husband. She's previously divorced and her three daughters from that marriage. And ultimately, they also divorced. Her oldest daughter at the time of this case was an adult and had moved on. And her two twins were in high school. And the high school that they choose to go to was closer to their dad. So Lori had given up her career in accounting to raise her family. And she had had a tough life. She had a tough go of things, Lori did. So Cozy Cove to her was paradise. It was quiet. It was calm. You know, the house was full of energy when her whole family was there. But at the time of this story, she's almost 50. She has no career anymore because she had given it up. There are no children in the house anymore. There's nobody just silence. So Lori was struggling. She was having a difficult time living there amongst the silence, but she did love the house. She loved her view from the house of the lake. Everything that these people that I just talked about on Cozy Cove, everything that they knew was very soon about to change. We're going to start in 2007 with September 8th. 
Ron and Monique Murdoch had to go out of town with their children to about six hours away to Monique's mom's. Her mother was gravely ill. And so they were going to see her one last time. And when they left, we're just going to call him the man. The man entered their home and went straight to their 12-year-old's bedroom, 12-year-old Samantha. While in the bedroom, the man took out Samantha's undergarments, her underwear, her little training bras, and he touched them and took pictures of himself on her bed, masturbating with those items. He ended up taking six pairs of her underwear as souvenirs, and he left. When Ron and Monique and the family returned, nobody noticed anything at all because that's all he took. No TVs, no radios, no VCRs, no nothing, just the little girl's underwear. So nobody realized. Two weeks later, they had to go back to Monique's mother's funeral because she had passed away. And the man knew this. And he went back into the home and did much of the same, uh, recording himself doing these things, set up a whole tripod, the whole nine yards, um, videos, pictures, all with this 12 year old's underwear. So not too far after that, this was September. This is now October 19th of 2007. Somebody broke into Larry Jones's 11 year old granddaughter's room. Um, they lived there with their mother who was Larry's daughter or daughter. Yes. So for whatever reason, the man knew that they weren't around and he enters the house. And just like the time before, underwear were taken, this time bras and bathing suits as well. Pictures, all of that. The man also kept a diary. So he kept notes of all of these things that he was doing, along with the videos uh, and the, the photographs. Now, on this particular occasion, Larry Jones's son-in-law saw a slender man running in the back of the houses, but he couldn't catch him. And they went into the houses and, you know, the neighbors were looking around to see if any of them had been broken into, but nobody had. So they just dismissed it. And they thought, you know, maybe he was just running through or whatever. But <clears throat> these break-ins were not just happening on Cozy Cove. And they were not just happening in Tweed. In October of 2008, a home on Apollo Way in Ottawa was broken into. And in this house lived three young girls between the ages of 12 and 21. They were out of town. The entire family was out of town. The man knew this and he broke in and spent several hours doing very much what he had done in the other homes, masturbating, touching all of their underwear, their undergarments, you know, taking some as souvenirs. Uh, he was getting more bold. He took out some of the photo albums, and I know those aren't a thing anymore, but back then they were, and left them open in the girls' bedrooms and kind of spread them out so that they would know that somebody was there. And on the 12-year-old's computer, he opened up a Word document and just left one word, merci, and left that up so that she would see that when she returned. This was reported to the police. And later in November of 2008, because of all of these strange break-ins occurring, the police were not very concerned, it didn't seem. There were two break-ins in the Falling Brook neighborhood. And they put out this very small article. And the article said, police search for leads in a pair of break-ins. And it went on to say the only items that were taken were female underwear, but please keep your doors locked, you know, be vigilant, make sure you're looking around and 
you know, you're being safe. But again, these were neighborhoods that were safe. So while people took heed and they listened, they didn't really listen. You know, they're thinking, could this be a teenager who's just playing pranks? Or is this some kind of crazy pervert roaming around? Nobody really knew. So it wasn't a panic at all at this point. New Year's Eve of 2008 comes. And Brian Rogers and Brenda Constantine and their 15-year-old daughter were out of town. The man knew. (laughs) They lived in a town called Orleans. Not New Orleans. This is in Canada. So they go out of town. And the man, again, does the very same thing. This time, he uses the young girl's makeup brush and her hairbrush and is recording himself, like putting these items against his penis and on his penis and then leaving them there for her to use. But the strange part of that is she would never know that he had done those things to her makeup brushes. So it's like he was doing it and recording it so that he knew that he did it to her and that he could later watch it. He ended up taking 68 pairs of underwear, undergarments, those things from the home. So when they return, this is something very noticeable. I mean, her entire dresser drawer was emptied and that's crazy. You can't misplace that much of your underwear So they called the police. I mean, initially they were thinking maybe she misplaced them, but you you don't misplace 68 items. So they call the police and the police, you know, come in and they do everything they can. They did find a semen sample on the daughter's dresser and they put that in for DNA. But, you know, this is 2008. So things weren't coming back very quickly. The young girl was terrified to go into her room for months. And this prompted her parents to want to call a neighborhood meeting so that they could let everybody know that this kind of stuff was happening because they had heard rumors of other break-ins and they're thinking, this is crazy. We need to let everybody know. And the police said, no, they did not want the man to be tipped off. So they said, no, we don't want you to do that. And this is a mistake that I bet those police officers regret to this very day. The break-ins continued, obviously. Again, other towns, Belleville, Brighton, Orleans, Tweed, they had dubbed him through rumor, not officially, the Tweed Creeper, right? So he, in his own mind, was becoming bolder. He wanted more. He wasn't satisfied with just breaking in and masturbating and videoing himself and stealing underwear. His cravings were becoming much more frequent. And while he could go months before, or he could peep in windows and, you know, stand outside of homes naked, which he also did, What kind of neighborhood can you just stand outside windows naked? I mean, in any case, that happened too. But he was finding it difficult to resist his urges and things went much further. On October, on September 17th of 2009, Jane and her eight week old baby had come home around 930. She had been visiting her mom that night, which she often did. And one of his habits, by the way, was to stalk them so closely that he knew when they were out of the home and he would break into these homes the night before or the week before so that he would have a plan. So he was sure of how to get in, how to get out. Very strange. So she gets home, she puts her baby to bed and around 11, she herself goes to bed. 
again, she wasn't used to all this quiet. So she always locked her doors. Around 1 a.m., she's woken up by this person with a the man, the a fabric over her face. And she has, I mean, imagine being woken up like that. You have no idea what in the world is happening to you. So she wakes up and she doesn't understand what's happening. And she's saying to him, how did you get in? I locked the door and he doesn't answer. Now (laughs) that in itself is terrifying that somebody is over you, has a fabric over your eyes, your infant baby is in the next room and you don't know what is going on. So she asks him, are you here to rape me? What, what are you doing here? And he tells her, no, you know, I'm not, I'm not going to rape you. He's very calm. He tells her, yeah, I'm not going to hurt you. I'm not going to rape you. And he pulls her up so that he can secure something over her eyes other than the fabric that he's holding. And he puts a pillowcase over her head, but she begins to hyperventilate. So he takes it off. And he tells her he has a camera and that he's going to take pictures of her. And she's completely confused. Why are you going to take pictures of me? I don't, I'm not attractive. I, you know, I just had a baby. And he tells her she's perfect and she's sweet. And his face is covered. Keep that in mind. And he comes over and is feeling her breasts and putting his hands up inside of her shirt. And she's now completely terrified that she's going to be raped and he secures her hands. And that's when she begins to really struggle because she knows if my eyes are covered, my hands are now tied, how am I going to get out of this and save my baby? So she just does whatever he wants her to do. And he lifts her shirt up and is pulling her pajama pants down. And now she's, she's nude and he's making her pose blindfolded for all of these photos and videos that he's taking of her. I can't, I can't personally imagine the blindfold is what gets me. (laughs) Uh, That probably would scare me to death if I was blindfolded and being forced to pose in these disgusting positions so that this man who isn't saying much can take photos of me and I have an infant in the next room. And that's all she was concerned about. She was crying. She was asking about her baby and he was becoming impatient. He told her over and over he was not going to hurt the baby she just needed to cooperate and then he would go and crazy enough she cooperated and as suddenly as all this started it ended even though it was two hours he helped her put her clothes back on and took her to her baby's room and said count to 300 before you take off your blindfold she got to 70 And she stopped and he screamed out and she was like, oh my God, he's still here. So she just keeps counting and she's feeling around. She can feel her baby, her baby's breathing. Everything is okay. She keeps counting. And at 200, she yells out, he's gone. She rips it off and grabs her baby. She immediately calls her boyfriend's mother and the mother flies over there with the brother and they're trying to help her. They're looking for clues. They had already called 911. Now, these homes are 30 to 40 feet apart. Nobody saw anything. Nobody heard anything at all. This man entered and exited. Nobody heard or saw anything. Her patio door in the back was slightly open. That's all they saw. Now, she was blindfolded. That's all the mother saw, that the door was open. None of the neighbors saw anything. This young lady, Jane, was about five foot two. She described the man being blindfolded. It's the only thing she could come up with. 
She said maybe between the ages of 30 and 50, average build, about a head taller than she was, no facial hair, no glasses, and he smelled dirty. She said that the smell was really bad. All of that questioning was over. Forensics came in, tried to get anything. They got nothing. She packed her bags. She left Cozy Cove forever. Now, this was on September 17th of 2009. Only 13 days later, he hits again on the same street. In the same street. There's only 21 homes here. Lori, who I told you about, who's now alone and her children are gone and she's divorced. She's into true crime like many of us, right? She falls asleep watching Law and Order. And she is underneath her daughter's Barbie comforter. She falls asleep like this all the time on her couch, doesn't think anything of it. And she's abruptly awoken to her face burning and thinking her house is on fire because of the burning on her face. She tries to get up and she is being held down underneath this comforter. And she's now completely panicked. She has no idea what is happening to her. And she is much more animated than Jane was. So she is freaking out. And the person, the man, puts his forearm over her throat and begins to press down. And she's crying, saying, what in the world? What is happening? And the man replied, don't you realize what is happening? You're being cleaned out. Be quiet. Don't make a sound. It's my job to control you and you will do what I want. They will take what they want and then we will go. Do not challenge my authority. And she's sobbing. And through her tears, she says to him, please don't let my children find me like this. And he assures her, I'm not going to kill you. I'm only here to take photos. She asks, why? Why are you here to take photos of me? He says, so that I, you know that I have photos of you. That's why. Good Lord in heaven. He stands her up and he fully blindfolds her. The whole time she's listening for them, the other people who are in her house robbing her, but she hears nothing and she's blindfolded. So if you close your eyes, they say your other senses kick in better. She hears nothing. There's nobody there. Who, who is he referring to? She doesn't know, but she's afraid to question him too much. So she doesn't. She stands up. He secures her arms and he secures her eyes so that she can't see anything. But he pulls the blindfold so tight it rips out clumps of her hair and she's crying more. And she tells him, it's so tight. Please, can you loosen it a bit? And he comes over just as nice as could be and loosens it. He even goes and gets her Tylenol for her headache hurting and some water. He rubs her temples. He asks if she's okay. And she's like, yes. Now, I told you, Lori watches crime shows. So she tried to do the thing where you make the person know that you're a human being. You try to relate to them, to connect to them in some way. That's what she was trying to do. She asked him, are you married? And he said, no, because he's too young. And she was, you know, trying to just ask him questions, saying things like, well, at least you're not as bad as them because they're robbing me, <laughs> even though there was literally nobody there. And she knew that there was nobody there. Finally, he stands her up and he begins to do the same thing that he did to Jane pushing his hands under her bra and squeezing her breasts. And she's moving away. She does not want this to happen at all. Uh, and he did not like that. 
the more she moved and resisted, the angrier he got. And he had her bra up and her shirt off. And he ultimately gets so frustrated that he puts them back on her, but not because he was going to allow it. He removed his very large knife from the bag that he brought with him. And in one quick motion, cut her shirt from the neck to her waist, clean in half. And that made her understand very fast that she had to comply with what he was saying, because that could have been her. He never even nicked her with the knife. He was able to slice it so fast and clean that it just fell off. She knew I better do what he says. And she did. The shirt is off now. Her bra is off. Everything is on the floor. And he goes to put his hands down her pants. And she had urinated on herself. She tells him that. And he tells her it's fine. Take them off. And he helps her get them off. And then he makes her pose. He makes her stand there crying, red-faced, naked, and pose. She does everything that he wants her to do. And she's just begging to live. That's the only thing that she was concerned with was seeing her children again. But every time he moved and went to do something, she thought he had a weapon and would panic more and hyperventilate. She didn't understand what the hell was happening. How many of us would? <laughs> I totally understand what was going through her mind at that point. And she's all alone. Who's going to find her if this man kills her? How long will it be before somebody even notices she's gone? That's a really sad thought. He would leave periodically to go check on the others and she would listen close. There was nobody there. <laughs> and finally, when he was getting ready to go, he told her to get on her hands and knees, kind of in a doggy style position and put her head on the arm of the couch. And she tried to resist that because she was positive he was going to shoot her in the back of the head. Keep in mind, all of this is recorded. This is how we know the details of this story. She didn't want to do it. And he forced her and she did it. And he takes two more photos with his penis in the foreground of the shots. Was he undressed this whole time? I have no idea. In any case, he sits her back up, wraps her in a comforter and says, you know, we're going to go now. They've got everything that they need. As if this was some big heist. He had been there like two and a half hours. What in the world could they have even taken? And I'm going to come back and check on you in 10 minutes. Don't move. She couldn't move. She was frozen because she was terrified. She let 15 minutes pass and finally took the blindfold off. She calls the police. She tries explaining what happened. How do you explain that? What do you say? <laughs> a man broke in my house and took pictures of me. And I think maybe I was being robbed, but I don't really know. And I'm naked with urine on me in a Barbie comforter. Send the police. What she does tell them is it could have been her ex-husband and his friends. And they asked, are you sure? And she said, no, but I can't think of who would do this. I don't know what's happening. So the police and the forensics get there. Keep in mind, she's still in restraints and they question her for hours while she's still in the restraints. I don't, I don't understand that part. They do get a thumbprint off the back of her neck that they can use for DNA, thank God. But again, these are different towns where they're getting the DNA from. Um, I don't know if at that time there was like the central database where you could cross check all of this stuff, but it didn't seem like any of that happened because this continued to happen. 
on October 29th of 2009, Larry Jones was coming home and he sees police cars all out in front of his house. And he's thinking he was robbed, maybe. And he pulls up and he gets out. And remember, Larry has family on the police force. So he goes into his house and he sees a command center set up. And he's like, what the hell is going on in my house? And one of the officers who he doesn't recognize grabs him by the arm and tells him, you need to come with us to the station. You have some questions to answer. Now, Larry is an outspoken man. He's not shy. And he insists on knowing what the hell this is all about. And they get him in the car and they tell him, you, you're going to be questioned for the two attacks that have taken place on your street. And he's just not happy. <laughs> they get down there. He doesn't recognize these police. He doesn't know where they came from. And they're asking him, is there any reason your DNA would be in these ladies' houses? And he's like, I, you know, I don't know. Remember, Larry's the fix-it guy. He could have fixed a sink. His fingerprints could be in the house. He could have fixed a lawnmower, anything. So he doesn't know if, if maybe it's possible, I guess. But they ask him if he wants a lawyer. And at this point, he's extremely frustrated. He was down there for hours. And he tells them, I don't want a lawyer. I'll give you my DNA, my fingerprints. I'll take a polygraph test. I don't give a shit. I'll do whatever you need to do because I'm not your guy. And you better start looking for the right person. But they weren't done with Larry. They had found penthouse or Playboy magazines in his home while they had him down there. And basically to them, that proved that Larry was some kind of disgusting, crazy pervert, and that he needed to tell all his dark secrets before they let them out, and they were going to. And Larry's thinking in his mind of the description that he had heard when Jane was attacked, 30 to 50, average build, no facial hair, no glasses, flat stomach, <laughs> not hairy. Larry was 65 years old with a very thick mustache, five foot 11, 215 pounds, glasses, and a pretty good size pot belly. So now he's, he's, he's beside himself. They're also questioning his wife, inappropriate questions about their sex life, but that's back at the house. They ask Larry, did your father beat you? Did your mother molest you? What kind of sex do you like? Do you like it doggy style? Do you give it to your wife that way? The officer proceeds to tell him that the only acceptable sex is woman on top, man on bottom, or man on top, woman on bottom. And Larry laughs and says, I don't know where you've ever heard that, but that's not true. You know, I mean, who even says that? So he promises to come back for the polygraph test and all of that, which he does, and he passes. They tell him he's cleared. Now, they had taken several things from his home, and his wife goes back down there and says, you know, you guys cleared my husband, allegedly, but you still have all of our stuff. We want it back, and people are treating him crazy, and all of this is unacceptable, and they act like they don't know what she's talking about. You know, as far as we know, he's cleared. But people who once loved Larry were now crossing the street at the mere sight of him. Things were missing from his workshop. Uh, there were tons of rumors about him being this sexual deviant. So he goes to Lori and asks, you know, why do you think? That this is happening. Rumor had it, Lori told the police that the voice was Larry's. The man's voice was Larry's. It matched. So he hears this and goes to her. And she says, well, I'm sorry. I was put up to it. You were put up to it? 
So I guess the dad of the dad of Larry's son's ex-wife was the one who put Lori up to this and she went along with it. Very same day that Larry was being interrogated, the man was busy. Anne Marsan Cook lived close to Tweed, but not on Cozy Cove. She was nearby. She had purchased an old farmhouse with her husband, and he traveled a lot for work. So she had been staying over at a friend's house. They had had a party earlier in the day, and there was going to be, or they had a party that evening. She slept there. The next day she comes home, <clears throat> excuse me, to get dressed for another friend's party. And as she's in her mirror getting changed, she notices behind her that the drawers, it's very difficult for me to say drawers. <laughs> I've been practicing. Uh, Bostonians say draws, but the drawers, she noticed that they were open and she knew she didn't leave them open. They were on her nightstand the nightstand drawers. So she notices them in the mirror and she walks over to them and she realizes that she's missing her sex toys as well as um, X-rated videos. So she's missing them. She runs downstairs to talk to her friend and goes across the way and asks him, you know, are you joking? Like, were you in my house? Did you take these? And her friend assures her, no, absolutely not. No, I didn't. Her friend is a male, by the way. And he's like, no, I wouldn't do that to you. I didn't do that. So they go back to her house. And while in the house, they realize her underwear are gone as well. And her lingerie. And now she's just very unsure of what to do. So they're having a conversation about it and they both decide together they're not going to call the police because what are they going to say? My dildos are gone. That was the conversation they were having in the house. So in any case, they get dressed and she's nervous. You know, she's concerned. So she stays at his house again, her friend's house, and she comes home the next day. When she comes home the next day, her friend walks her and he stays downstairs. She was only going to run upstairs and scan something or print something and then leave. Well, she sees on her computer screen, go ahead, call the police. I'd love to tell the judge about your really big dildos. And she screams and her friend runs up the stairs and then they realize the conversation that they were having. The man was in the house. He was listening to them the entire time. So now they do call the police because they're in a panic. At the end of it all, after going through everything, they realize she's missing over 150 pieces of lingerie, sexy clothes, underwear, bras, and those kinds of things. Now, Anne mentions that she's heard rumors that things were happening only 20 minutes away in Tweed. And the officer was completely unaware that that was going on. And again, they were in a time where it's not like the internet today where you pop up on Facebook and post this and it goes viral or you can get on YouTube and do a video and everybody knows that there's something going on in your town or on your street. It was just different, even though, you know, it's 2009. I mean, I guess that's quite a while ago if you think about it, but things weren't able to fly across town to town to town as quickly. So the officer was completely unaware. Things were getting more serious. Only one week later, November 25th, 2009, and I'm going to issue a trigger warning. If you cannot deal with graphic descriptions, you probably should tune out now or fast forward about 10 minutes. 
there was a lady named Marie France Cumeau. And I hope I'm not butchering her name too. Uh, she was a beautiful, bright, sweet, friendly brunette. She was a flight attendant and she worked for the 437 transport squad, the same one that um, the gentleman on Cozy Cove, Russell Williams, worked for. She started her career loading and unloading cargo in the military. That's what she was doing. The Canadian Forces aircrafts is what she would load and unload. She was deployed to Afghanistan where she stayed in a tent and very brutal, extreme weather conditions. But according to everybody who knew her, she was always the most caring person. If somebody on the base, somebody else was having a bad day, Marie would be the very first person to find out what was wrong, how could she help, what could she do to Marie. Her job was making a difference. She really, truly felt like she could make a difference. But there was another part of her job that was fulfilling her own needs, travel. Marie wanted nothing more than to see the world. That was her dream. It's really what she wanted to do. Within 10 years of her being loading and unloading the cargo, she became a flight attendant, and then she became a VIP flight attendant, meaning she was flying people like the Canadian Prime Minister and the Governor General of Canada. And she was handpicked for this because of her amazing personality. Uh, she loved her job. It was something she truly cared about. A lot of us like our jobs, but she really enjoyed it because of the places she would go and the things she was able to see and the cultures she was able to experience. It meant a lot to her. On her very last trip, she traveled with the governor general of Canada. Uh, I'm sorry, with the prime minister, the prime minister. And they went to um, Japan, Singapore, and India. And she had always wanted to go to India. So this was an absolute dream for her. And she was so excited when she got back. She was calling her friends and her family and telling everybody about everything that was going on. Um, you know, when you're so excited about something and other people are excited for you, but you just can't contain your excitement. That's how Marie was. She was just over the moon that she got to do that. And she couldn't wait for her next trip, what it was going to be. She calls her boyfriend. His name is Paul. Uh, he was also a pilot, actually. So she's talking to Paul on the phone and she's making plans to get together for dinner in a day or two so that she could just tell him everything about this trip. Uh, and he was excited for her. While she was gone, he had been renovating her bathroom and also taking care of her cat. Her cat's name was Bixby. So he was doing that for her, but they had gotten into a little argument because she accused him of breaking in or being in, not breaking in because he did have a key, but being in her house and possibly taking some of her underwear. So. He vehemently denied this. He said, absolutely not. I would never. What are you talking about? You know, he thought, it, you know, did she misplace them? What is she talking about? But she had actually gone so far as to tell her friends, I think Paul took my underwear. She was concerned. She noticed that they were gone uh, weeks before. And she didn't understand exactly what the heck was happening? Why was she missing pairs? You know, if I was missing pairs of underwear, I probably wouldn't even notice. But these ladies were apparently more organized than I am. And they did notice. So she does. In any case, the man, while she is on the phone, hanging up with Paul, he's silent. He's waiting. He's waiting outside of her home for her to fall asleep. And he is a very patient, patient person. He would wait for hours sometimes before these women fell asleep. 
So he was getting chilly. He decided, as he had been in the home before, as the underwear stealer, to enter through the basement. And Marie ends her call with her boyfriend. And she's nude because she had just gotten out of the shower. She had, I believe, what they called a shawl over her. But I was guessing that that's probably a towel. And she goes to look for Bixby because she couldn't find him, but she hears him. He's in the basement. So she goes down to look for him and she's calling to him and she can see him. He's across the room. And she follows his gaze because he won't pay attention to her. And when she does follow his gaze, she sees the man and he's covered his, his face is covered, of course. And Marie was a spitfire. She was not going to run the other way. She attacked screaming, you bastard and went after him, but he was prepared for such, you know, things. He always prepared. He always planned in advance. So he knew either she would run and he would chase or she would attack and he would subdue her in some way. And they tussled for a bit and he smashed her over the head with his flashlight, hoping he was going to knock her out, but he didn't initially. He made her fall enough and her head was cut and she could feel the blood, but He wasn't lucky enough to completely knock her out enough to pick her up again, trigger warning and attach her to a pole using duct tape. So he attaches her body to the pole. He covers her eyes. He covers her mouth with duct tape. And if you're thinking of duct tape, you're thinking of that heavy gray, super sticky tape. And now it's over her eyes and her mouth. And she's got to be completely terrified. So what does he do? He goes and gets his camera to get pictures of her in this position. And he takes a few photos of her while she is attached to the pole naked. And then he takes off the duct tape. But right before that, He leaves the basement right before that, and he goes upstairs. He wanted to do a few things to ensure that he wouldn't be disturbed. He finds her extra key on the kitchen counter and puts it into the lock and snaps it off so that Paul or anybody else who might have an extra key cannot get in to disturb what he was doing. He went around outside and put the screen back that he had moved to gain access to her house. He went and uh, shut off the lights in the house to ensure it was dark. He got covers, blankets, comforters from her bed and closet and put them up over the windows and used knives from her kitchen to dig into the drywall to ensure that it was dark, that nobody could see inside. And then he went back downstairs to get Marie and he removes the duct tape. And before we even get into the graphic part, go get a piece of duct tape and just put it on your arm and leave it there and then pull it off. So he does, he takes off. Now he's taking off the duct tape from her mouth and he warns her don't scream. Do not tempt me. Don't scream. And again, Marie is a fighter. She's not going to listen to him. They get halfway up the stairs and she screams as loud as she can. Help, help me. Screeching. And he smashes her head twice off the wall and she crumples down onto the steps, naked, bleeding. Now she's unconscious. And of course, he goes and gets his camera and takes close-up photos of her face as well as her vagina for whatever reason. He leaves her crumpled for a bit. 
and he sets up his camcorder upstairs in her bedroom. And he goes down to get her and he brings her back up and he wraps her bleeding head in a towel and secures that with the duct tape. Now she still has duct tape over her eyes. He again covers her mouth and her face, everything except for her nose, so that she'd have a little space to breathe. He was ready to start performing, and he took all of his clothing off. And this time was going to be very, very different from the times before. She wasn't waking up. He tried to move, move her around and she wouldn't wake up. So he began to perform on his own. He had a camera and a camcorder and he proceeded to do what he wanted, raping her. He was snapping photos as he entered her, as the video was recording off in the distance as if there was some kind of porno movie. And he got close-ups of entering, close-ups of her face while she was unconscious, what was left of her face. Uh, all you could see is her nose and a tiniest bit, you know, of a lip. And he continued raping her from several angles. And finally, due to the movement, she woke up. The towel was loosening a bit on her head, moving the tape around her mouth that was one or two pieces. And she kind of wakes up and she's just like, what is happening to her? She doesn't understand, of course, just like the other women. She's not sure what is going on. She asks him, please, to stop that she will be good. She'll obey. She'll do what he wants, uh, that the restraints were too tight. She couldn't move that whatever he wanted, you know, and I, I would assume that that's what most women try to do is say, I'm going to comply. I'm going to do what you want. Just please. But he was already in somewhat of a frenzy by this point. This was the first that we know about documented full rape. But he, he ignored her and he continued to rape her until he ejaculated, which he caught in his hands and brought it to the bathroom. This led me to believe that perhaps he was going to let her live because he was not trying to leave his DNA. But he brings it to the bathroom and he flushes it. And as soon as she hears this, she tries. She jumps up, tries to get to the bathroom to slam the door. And she's thinking in her mind to go to the window, you know, try to get out of the window. Unbeknownst to her, it's covered. She can't get out. And she wasn't very steady from being knocked out. So before she could do much of anything, he grabs her and smashes her face into a mirror and shatters it. So it was too late. And he was very, very angry that she attempted to do that. So for several more hours, she was raped in every way imaginable on recording. She told him, I know you're going to kill me, but I've been good. Please just let me go. I won't tell anybody. And I want to live so badly. He ignores her. She asks him, are you going to kill me? Are you going to let me live? And he asks her, did you expect to live? He then walked towards her and placed duct tape over her nose as well. And she was still trying to beg. And he covered her mouth, effectively beginning to suffocate her. She was losing her air, and slowly she died. All the while, 
he was taking photos right up until her last breath, videos as well. When she was gone, he walked over and removed the duct tape and placed her on her bed and crossed her ankles, took everything that he had touched and threw it into the washing machine with a bottle of bleach. And then he left. He went back to his daily life. Paul, her boyfriend, was very concerned. He had not heard back from her. They were supposed to go to dinner and he kept calling. So he decides finally to go over because he can't quite understand if she was still upset about the underwear issue or what exactly was going on, but he felt as though he needed to really get in touch with her and find out. So he goes and he tries to use his key. And of course, the man had broken off the key in the door so he couldn't get in. But he sees her car and he's thinking, well, I know something is going on. She would answer. And he runs to the back patio and he's able to get in that way. And he finds her in her bed. And he begins to scream. Neighbors. He talks to neighbors and they say they didn't hear a thing. They never heard anything. And the police come and they do their searches. And of course, they're questioning Paul. And they question some of Marie's friends who say that she was suspicious about Paul because he had been allegedly taking her underwear. Paul gets a polygraph test and he passes and he's cleared. Then another man at the base one of her co-workers was known to be really odd and he would say inappropriate things. He wasn't very good with communication to other people. So he was a suspect there for a bit and then they cleared him as well. So the mystery went on and the man continued to do these horrendous things. January 27th of 2010, Jessica Lloyd was running on her treadmill. Her home was off the road, but the man saw her. And he continued to watch her for a bit. Jessica had no idea that she was being watched. On January 28th, Jessica returned home around 10 30 she had been out with friends after work and she texted her friend night night meaning i got home safely i wanted you to know that i got home for the most part her friends were worried jessica lived in her childhood home by herself she had just purchased it from her mom about eight months prior to this night she loved her childhood home it's where she grew up. It's where laughter filled the halls with herself and her brother. It's where things were good. And it's where she felt safe. So she was brave. She didn't feel as though living here by myself off the main road is going to, and she wasn't way far off a main road. Uh, you could see her house from the main road, but she never felt unsafe. And her mother had mentioned to her the Tweed Creeper. And she reassured her mother, oh, I think he's been caught or that's died down or something to that effect where you don't have to worry about me, mom. I'm fine. So January 28th, she returns home around 1030. And, you know, she gets herself ready for bed. And across the field, the man's watching. He has got his SUV parked across the field and he's keeping an eye and he's patient as we've talked about. He would wait for her to fall asleep. He had been there the night before as well. So he knew how he was going to get in and how he was going to get out. Strangely enough, a police officer noticed the SUV parked in the field near Jessica's home. And she got out of her car 
and she went to Jessica's door and knocked. She wasn't too suspicious, but she hadn't seen that there before and it wasn't too unusual. You know, it's kind of farm country-ish. So for a car to be out in a field, there could be reasons for that, but it just struck her as odd. So she goes and knocks on Jessica's door and looks around a little bit. And Jessica doesn't answer. I'm unsure what time this was, but the man at that very moment was waiting in Jessica's backyard. And the police officer gets back into her vehicle and she leaves. Jessica misses work the next morning. And this was extremely, extremely unusual. Jessica never missed work. She was extremely responsible. She was someone that was counted on in the office. She worked for the Tri Board Student Services, and she oversaw 645 bus routes. Um, always, always on time, always there. And if not, she would call in. So her supervisor decides, let me call. I can't get Jessica. Let me call Jessica's mother. So they call Jessica's mother, Roxanne, and they say, you know, have you heard from her? Do you know where she is? She didn't show up today. And Roxanne becomes immediately concerned because this is out of character. So she tries, you know, calling Jessica. She can't get her. And she decides, well, let me just drive over there and check myself. And on her way over there is um, Jessica's doctor's office. She looks there to see if Jessica's car is there. Maybe she was feeling sick, nothing. And she gets to her home and she sees her car there. So she was feeling relieved a bit and she uses her own key and she gets inside and there are all of Jessica's belongings. There didn't seem to be any struggle. Nothing was out of place. So she's becoming increasingly concerned now that Jessica's not there, but all of her stuff is there. So she begins to call Jessica's friends, her, her family, Jessica's brother, Andy, who she was extremely close to. And Andy was extremely concerned as well. So he comes to the house and what he notices are footprints going out Jessica's back door. And it's a pair of smaller footprints beside a pair of larger footprints. And they immediately call the police. A search begins. The police jump on this. They wasted absolutely no time. You know, in a lot of cases, you'll see where an adult goes missing. The police want you to wait because there's no law saying that if you're an adult and you want to take off that you can't because you can, but because of who Jessica was and the insistence of the family, and they knew there's no way that she would just have disappeared. This began additionally, he was careless. Those footprints were there, leaving a huge clue for the police that Jessica had been taken. Now, we're going to get to what happened the night before when he entered Jessica's home. And again, I'm going to give you a trigger warning. If you cannot deal with the graphic nature, please fast forward or turn this off. Jessica was wearing a black tank top and gray sweatpants, and she was sound asleep in her bed. And the man intended on knocking Jessica out. That is his MO now, it seems. So he used his flashlight and he hit her in the head while she was asleep and her eyes opened immediately. And now the two were staring at each other. And of course, she's terrified. And this time he brought along a whole bag of tricks. He has rope to tie her up with. And of course, his duct tape camcorder and his camera. He sets everything up and he's got her, you know, her eyes are covered. Her mouth is covered and she's bound. 
he goes around the house and collects lights, but not for the reason he collected Marie's lights. This time it was for his production. He wanted to make sure he had the perfect lighting in the room. So he put lights all around. He comes back and he attaches her hands to her headboard, even though she's already bound. But again, this was a production that he was putting on. He pulls out his knife, which is extremely sharp, as we remember from Lori's story, and he slits Jessica's tank top off of her body. And he tells her to spread her legs. And he takes the duct tape off and tells her to open her mouth and close her mouth. And he wants to see how compliant she's going to be. And she's sobbing. She doesn't, she doesn't want to die. She wants to live. So she complied. And again, like Marie, she was doing everything that she could. And any movement in a way that seemed like resistance, he would tell her, or ask her, you want to survive this, don't you? Do what I say. And she desperately wanted to live. He was also nude at this point, and he used no condoms. This led me to believe that Jessica was going to end up very much like Marie did, because now he is leaving footprints and he's not using condoms. He pulls out zip ties, which is new, and puts them around her neck and asks her if she knows what that is. And she shakes her head no. And she, remember, her eyes are covered in duct tape. He tells her, if I pull this, you die. If I hear something from you that I don't like. If you do something that I don't like, I'm going to pull this and you're going to die. And at that point, he puts his penis in her mouth with his hand on the end of the zip tie. And this continues on for a while and he hears a sound and he's cautious. He asks Jessica if she has animals, a cat, something. She tells him no. So he gets them both dressed. And he decides to take her to his own hiding spot where he would feel safer having her. So he gets them both dressed and he transports them to his hiding spot. And they get there and he allows her some sleep. What a sweet guy. He allows her to sleep for a little while. And finally, you know, he's pushing her, telling her to wake up. And Jessica, I don't know if it's true that Jessica actually had this medical situation or if she was acting. My assumption was she was acting, but she began to convulse and tell him that she needed a hospital immediately and said she only had 20 minutes before you know, she, she could die. And he holds her head through the whole thing and tells her not to swallow her tongue and don't bite her tongue and all of that. And cradles her head and tries to comfort her and she's stuttering and she's begging him to please take her to the hospital. But he's not going to do that. He lets her rest there for an hour. And she says to him, if I die, please tell my mother that I love her. At this point, I think the man knew what the ending of this was going to be. All of this was recorded, but she had rested for an hour. So now it was time for more rape and dress up. It was time for dress up. This was also new. He began to dress her in various lingerie outfits and making her pose hours 
for hours, this went on, and she complied with absolutely everything that he wanted her to do. All of it, dressing up in this, these ridiculous things and posing. And finally, that was over. And he sits her down and he tells her she's going home. He offers her a plate of fruit and she eats it. And he gets her fully dressed, shoes, sweatshirt. And one of the last photos of her is a huge smile, still duct tape over her eyes, dressed, thinking, oh, thank God I'm going home. And he walks her all the way to the door. And before she can step out of the door, he smashes her skull in with his flashlight. And she crumples to the floor. And there's blood everywhere. And he wraps her body fully in duct tape and then wraps her up and throws her in the garage because he's got a busy day ahead of him. And he leaves her there in the cold, dead. And he goes on about his day. He goes on about his day. Meanwhile, the police are searching for Jessica. And they put up a roadblock on February 4th of 2010. They knew what they were looking for. And the reason they knew was because the night that, that the SUV was parked out in that field, there was snow there. And motorists who passed by saw that vehicle in that field as well as the police officer. So the police investigating the case went and got those tire tracks. They knew what the treads on the tires look like. So this is great news. So they do a roadblock. And I really love the police in this case at this point. I mean, I'm not so happy about them from before when they weren't warning everybody in any case. They, the plan was two officers would stop each car coming on that road, Highway 37, that passes Jessica's house. And one would talk to the driver and the other one would be checking out the tires. They wouldn't do it in an obvious way at all. So they start and they're stopping each car and either letting them go or if they felt any suspicion or if the tires matched, they were supposed to be pulling them over and talking to them. One of the people who ends up driving by and, and what they're looking for is an SUV, a Tahoe Escalade, possibly an Explorer, they're not sure, 1998 to 1999. That's what they're looking for. And they were supposed to ask did you pass this location on any of these days? Did you notice anything strange and all of that? So one of the people who end up passing by is the Colonel Russell Williams. And they do the whole procedure, you know, one's talking to him and one's looking at his tires. And Russell was Marie's commanding officer. He had written a condolence letter to her family. Uh, and he told them, you know, I drive by here all the time uh, on my way to the base. So they let him go, you know, no problem. But there was something very unusual about Russell's tires. So might Russell be a suspect? We'll see.